uh, uh, not a pair of knife, but a hacksaw to certain sections of this bill. And with every breath in you, we want you, as long as you're a member of Congress, to keep fighting this monstrosity. And that is my pledge to the people of my district and the people of Georgia and the people of this great country. And with that, I yield back to the well, gentleman. I thank the gentleman for his participation. I, I'd, I'd like to point out the continuing resolution just passed by this House a few moments ago to fund the government for the rest of the year actually contained an almost $1 billion reduction in the implementation fund. It also contained $360 million reduction to the Department of Treasury for their implementation of their rules. So there were some serious blows dealt to the implementation side, not by Republicans. This was a pretty bipartisan vote. I think it had 320 votes at the, uh, at the end of the voting period. But this reduction is seen in a bipartisan fashion as being important because the gentleman's right. The torrent of regulations that's come out since the President's re-election has been nothing short of just astounding no wonder the governors wouldn't participate. The administration hid the ball till election day and then said, oh, now we're going to give you the rule for essential health benefits. In other words, they wouldn't tell the governors, what, they, what are you going to be required to cover? What are you going to be required to pay for? The, governments, the governors had no way of knowing until two days after election day. And then they said, you've got to be nuts. We're not going to sign up for that. So Health and Human Services says, okay, you've got another month. They say, you've got to be nuts. That's Christmas, Thanksgiving. Everybody's on vacation. Nobody can evaluate it. So they gave them another month, and then they finally said, time's up. So 26 states said, we're not going to do an exchange. The governor's just flat refused. You wouldn't be honest with us about what was going to be required, so we're not playing ball with you. And that is the right decision for them to make. I applaud that decision. Uh, I think first we're, we're closing down on the final moments of the hour, and I do want to point out to people, this is not a filibuster. This is a regular activity of the House of Representatives. Uh, we can come to the floor and talk about a topic. The majority leader and the leadership allowed us the time to talk about the three-year anniversary of the signing of the Affordable Care Act. Who can ever forget the Vice President standing up and saying this is a big darn deal uh, down at the White House, but third anniversary of a big darn deal the gentlelady from Minnesota recognized for her comments. Dr. Burgess, thank you so much. I just wanted to add this point to the whole debate that we're having today, that the unintended consequence of all of this is that we've now created a class system in America for health care. We can't overstate this enough. Before, we just had health care in America, and you tried to find the best doctor, and you tried to find the best possible care, but now what Obamacare creates is this. It's a class-based health care system where we segment patients into three different classes. Here's one. Here's the one that no American wants to be in. It's the Medicaid ghetto. And that's where the lowest possible care, where very few doctors will be available to offer this kind of care, the Medicaid ghetto. Then there's going to be the socialized medicine in the exchanges. And then finally, there's going to be a concierge care for those who are going to be at the top of the heap. So it won't be the same type of medicine that's available for everyone. We will have different class systems in health care. And guess who's going to get hurt the most? You, you're exactly right senior citizens, women, and children. I want to explain just briefly how that will be. You see, 56% of the people that are unhealthy today in America are in households that make less than 133% of the poverty level. So if you're sick, you're in a lower income household, and without employer coverage and employers, as was stated before by Dr. Gingrey, about 7 million people are going to be thrown off their very good coverage they have now. Over half of our unhealthy citizens will be stuck in Medicaid, and that doesn't provide adequate access. I can tell you from my state of Minnesota, people who are on that scale have to go from rural Minnesota, maybe travel a couple hundred miles to the Twin Cities, which they can't, to find anyone who will offer them the care they need. Here's the other thing. About two and a half times as many women than men get their coverage through their husband's coverage. And for all of these people who are going to lose their employer-sponsored health coverage, it's more likely to have two and a half times more women. And if they're unemployed and out of the labor force, they're in trouble. They're up a creek without a paddle. Because the problem here is going to be that women and children are in jeopardy of not having an option. Even if they make 400% more than the poverty line, which really sounds like a lot of money, 
you're not going to have the availability of getting on the health care exchange. You may not even get in the Medicaid ghetto. So in other words, you have to pay the tax, which they call a fee. You have to pay the big tax as a woman and as a mother of these children, but you're not getting any health insurance for it. It's a bad deal. And that's why I thank you, Dr. Burgess, for well, what you Gentlelady, yes, yield on that yes. point. Not only are you not getting health insurance, you're fined on top of it. You're fined on you top of it. You pay a fine, and you're still uninsured. That's right. At the end of the day, you're that's still right. uninsured. That's right. So, Mr. Speaker, it's the worst of all worlds. Your husband is having to pay for this very expensive insurance for himself, and the employer is maybe having a match on that. But you, you're out in the cold, your kids are out in the cold, and you're paying a tax on top of it to add insult to injury. Women are going to suffer. Children are going to suffer. Seniors are going to suffer. And, Mr. Speaker, there are going to be people who die because of this. And in this body, let it be said today that we don't want to see anyone die or anyone hurt or anyone denied. And that's exactly what this bill is going to do, which is why we have to repeal it. The day after this bill was passed, I introduced a bill to repeal, and every single one of the Republicans in this House has voted to repeal Obamacare. And now hopefully we're going to have another vote again soon, because we love people and we care about people and we want them to have the health care they need. I yield back. Well, and I thank the gentlelady for her comments. Can you imagine? I mean, where has the press been on this? If 500,000 children lost their health insurance under a Republican president, that would be the headline. That's right. We wouldn't hear anything else out of the press for a week. That's right. If people still showed up for the federal pre-existing program and the president said, no, no more, we're out of money, if it was a Republican president, that's all we'd hear about. The Republican president has prevented people from signing up to his own pre-existing program that he started. People need to be aware of what is happening. These things have been insidious. It's been three years. There's been a lot of information. It's complicated. I don't understand it anyway. Why do I have to be involved? You have to be involved. As the gentlelady just said, it is going to affect you and your family. Every man, woman, and child in this country for the next three generations is going to be affected by this very bad bill. It was the worst of processes. This was a bill that came over here from the Senate. The House really never debated this thing. The House passed a bill, H.R. 3590, in July of 2009, but it was a housing bill. 3590 got over to the Senate. Harry Reid said, I need a bill number for my health care bill. Here's 3590. What does it do? Oh, housing? Strip all the language out. So he amended it. Strike all after the enacting clause and insert. And what was inserted? The rest of the health care law. The Senate had to digest it and pass it in a few days' time right before Christmas Eve. Big snowstorm bearing down on Washington. They all voted for it to get out of town. Sixty votes in the Senate. It passed. Nancy Pelosi said, what is this thing? It's garbage. I haven't got 100 votes for this over in the House. But over the next three months, they twisted enough arms, they broke enough knees that this thing finally got the votes three years ago yesterday. <laughs> And three years ago today, it was signed into law. It was signed into law to the detriment of the entire country. I thank the gentlelady for joining me. I thank all the other members who are here. Mr. Speaker, I will yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman yields back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3, 2013, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Pocan, is recognized for 60 minutes as the designee of the minority leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I rise on behalf of the Congressional Progressive Caucus uh, to uh, recognize our special order hour, uh, not only to talk uh, a drop about the budget uh, plans we had this week, but more importantly, this is an hour to honor uh, organized labor in this country and what organized labor has done uh, for the middle class and for so many millions and millions of people uh, across this country. Uh, this week, the Congressional Progressive Caucus put the back-to-work budget uh, before this body. The back-to-work budget is based on a simple concept. Uh, the number one problem facing this country is not the deficit, it's the need to improve the economy and create jobs. And the single best way you can address the deficit is to get people back to work. Uh, the back-to-work budget did just that. It would have created 7 million jobs. It would have brought unemployment down to 5% within three years. And it would have still trimmed $4.4 trillion from the deficit. But what it did is it invested directly in the very things that create jobs, in infrastructure, in police and fire, in teachers, and in other services that are vital to this country. 
because we've been told by the Congressional Budget Office, the single entity that is a nonpartisan agency that both parties rely heavily on, that this year one half of our deficit is caused by uh, economic weakness and three quarters of the deficit in 2014 is caused by economic weakness. Now what is economic weakness? That means unemployment and underemployment. If you get the people of this country back to work, you will solve most of our problems in trying to deal with the deficit. So rather than make the end all goal solving the deficit, but it completely ignoring the economy, and as the Republican budget we saw that was on the floor today actually could cost two million jobs uh, in this country in the next year, uh, we need to right now be investing uh, in those jobs so that people are getting back to work and supporting their families and becoming taxpayers. Uh, and when they pay, we'll stop that trajectory and the deficit that we have caused by this weakened economy. So that's the answer. That's what we need to focus on. And that's why the Congressional Progressive Caucus put the back to work budget out this week. And it really is at the premise of what we really want to talk about, which is our support for the working men and women of this country and the support for organized labor. Because when we put our emphasis on jobs, we're recognizing the very hard work that labor has done in this country. And I just want to share a few historical uh, parts that labor has done, uh, which are so important in this nation. Uh, first of all, we have the weekend because of organized labor. Uh, in 1870, the average work week for most Americans was 61 hours. But many workers, including children, put in 10 to 16 hour work days, seven days a week. Many workers didn't have a single day off for a week or two in a row. In response, labor unions in the late 19th century and the early 20th century organized massive strikes demanding shorter work weeks. They fought so that Americans could be home with their loved ones instead of constantly toiling for their employers with no leisure time. By 1937, these labor actions created enough political momentum to pass the Fair Labor Standards Act. The FLSA created a federal framework for a shorter work week that included room for leisure time. So the reason uh, we have our weekends, our days off during the week, is because of the effort a century ago uh, by people in organized labor. Also, unions helped to end the child labor uh, laws that, that we had, uh, the lack of labor laws that we had in this country. Uh, child labor was prevalent before the growth of the labor movement. In the 19th and early 20th century, child laborers were commonplace in factories, shops, and other workplaces across this country. American children as young as five years old uh, worked in large numbers in mines, glass factories, textiles, agriculture, canneries, home industries, and as newsboys, messengers, black, blue, black boot blacks and peddlers. In fact, children were often preferred because factory owners viewed them as more manageable, cheaper, and less likely to strike. In many factories, children were forced to climb on and crawl into large, dangerous machines because they were the only workers small enough to do so. Uh, these dangerous child labor conditions uh, often caused the problem with people losing fingers, arms, legs uh, of children that could easily get caught and mangled in devices. Uh, beyond the equipment, the environment was a threat to children, as well as the factories that put out the fumes and toxins. When inhaled, these children uh, would often uh, result in illness, chronic conditions, or disease. And harvesting crops at extreme temperatures for long hours was considered normal for children. The labor movement spearheaded the fight against uh, the child labor practices that were going on. As early as 1836, we had union members at the National Trades Union Convention made the first formal public proposal recommending that states establish a minimum age for factory work. That year, Massachusetts enacted the first state law restricting child labor for workers under 15. Over the next several decades, the efforts of the labor movement successfully achieved minimum age laws in other states, and in 1881, the AFL proposed a national law banning all children under 14 from employment. And in 1892, the Democratic Party adopted uh, the AFL's child pl labor platform and began to push for national child labor laws. And finally, in 1938, Congress included minimum ages of employment and hours of work for children in the Fair Labor Standards Act. Unions have spearhead spearheaded the fight for the Family and for the Medical Leave Act. 
Uh, labor unions like the AFL-CIO Federation led the fight for the 1993 law, which requires state agencies and private employers with more than 50 employees to provide up to 12 weeks per year of protected leave for workers to leave for a newborn, newly adopted child, seriously ill family member, or the worker's own illness. And thanks to the labor movement, employers are required by the FMLA to continue group benefits, including dental and optical benefits, during family or medical leave. Uh, the law also requires that employees can't be retaliated against for merely taking their federally protected leave. And under the law, uh, they must, uh, when they've completed their family or medical leave, they must be allowed to return to the same or an equivalent position with equivalent pay, benefits, and working conditions. Yet another thing that organized labor has done for the American people. Uh, they've pushed throughout their career for workplace safety, uh, not just for children, but for adult workers. Uh, in, in the federal government uh, had efforts by the federal government to ensure workplace health and safety were minimal until the passage of the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970, better known as OSHA. Uh, the laws were so lax that in places for some employers, it was cheaper for the employer to replace a worker injured in the workplace than it was to introduce safety measures. Uh, there was little recourse or relief for the survivors of dead workers or injured employees. In the early 1900s, uh, labor unions had pressured many states to enact workers' compensation laws that discouraged employers from permitting unsafe workplaces. Uh, prior to OSHA's enforcement, 14,000 workers uh, died each year from workplace hazards and 2 million more were disabled or harmed uh, during those uh, years in these unsafe workplaces. And it wasn't until the 1960s that the movement again be began for a comprehensive workplace safety law, once again backed by the labor movement. Uh, that law went into effect on April 28, uh, 1971, declaring Congress's intent, quote, to assure so far as possible every working man and woman in the nation uh, safe and healthful working conditions and to preserve our human resources. Those are just some of the benefits that we have seen because of organized labor's efforts over the last century and century and a half. Uh, they also were instrumental in, instrumental in passing the Social Security Act of 1935. They were instrumental in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And their support for World War II uh, was unmatched in making sure that we had workers to deal with what we needed to back home while we had so many people uh, fighting for our country overseas. Those are just some of the efforts. But there's more. Uh, part of being a part of organized labor has meant so much uh, for this country. If you are a union member, let me just offer a few of the things that you're more likely to have because you're part of a union. Uh, one, you will earn higher wages. Union members earn 30% more than their non-union counterparts. So you'll have a better chance at a living wage, the ability to support your family because you are a part of a union. You'll have more on-the-job training. Workers, uh, union workers are more likely to have access to formal on-the-job training, making employees more skilled and adding to productivity. And something I should mention, and I should have mentioned from the beginning, is uh, I have been a small business owner for 25 years, uh, over half of my lifetime. I opened a small business when I had hair, and it was dark. It was a long time ago. Uh, but I, my business has also been a union business. I have a union specialty printing business. And I can tell you one of the very important reasons why many of us who choose to have unions in our businesses, because we know the value, is because of what I just talked about, that training. Many unions have apprenticeship programs where you can get the very best, most qualified and skilled employees to be able to come to your place from day one. And one of those other benefits for me as a small business owner is they're more likely to stay in my business. So I now have the turnover of constantly training new employees. I have the benefit of someone who's going to stay with me for a long time. Another thing, if you're a member of a union, you have safer working places. Union workers are more likely to be trained on health and safety rules, and union workplaces are more likely to enforce OSHA standards. Uh, you're also more likely to receive workers' compensation. Union members get their benefits faster and return to work more quickly. When workers are injured, the union helps workers through the often complicated process of filing for workers' compensation, and they protect the workers from employer retaliation. 
And finally, uh, you have a better chance as a union member to have health insurance. Nearly 80 percent of the unionized workers receive employer-provided health insurance compared with 49 percent of non-union workers. Union members are more likely to have short-term disability and life insurance coverage. Those are just some of the benefits uh, that you will see from union workers. Now, specifically, um, I would like to talk about some of the problems that unions are facing today because there are several uh, very significant issues. Uh, not only is it in the states and in the halls of Congress that they're having a hard time uh, making sure that we continue to protect workers uh, and the unions that are working to protect those workers, uh, but very specifically within agencies. I would like to read a story uh, from, I believe it's the New York Times, about a situation that just happened this year uh, in the state of New York. And I'm just going to read parts of this article, but I think uh, it'll be especially significant. This was written uh, in mid-February, so this happened at the end of January uh, this year. Uh, and I'll read it from the beginning, and I'll, I'll take a, a few breaks in here. Cablevision, uh, the article is that Cablevision, Norma Ray's been escorted outside. Cablevision takes pride in its open-door policy for employees. So two weeks ago, a tight-knit band of cable television installers gathered at a company depot in Brooklyn to pick up route sheets and put ladders and tools in their vans when they trooped inside to ask a vice president for a couple minutes of his time. Last winter, these workers overcame fierce management opposition and voted to join the Communication Workers of America only to spend nine months in a rancorous contract talks. They wanted to ask the vice president if Cablevision was serious about a contract agreement or if they only wanted to break their union. They waited for 20 minutes to talk, then 20 more. Lakeisha Johnson, 44, drew restless and walked to the front office. A manager told her to go back inside. Then the vice president walked in and asked, essentially, who's supposed to be working now? Every worker, 22 in all, raised a hand. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President said, according to multiple accounts, I am sorry to tell you that you've all been permanently replaced. I said, what, Ms. Johnson said, replaced? You just fired us? You don't even know what we want. Ms. Johnson said the Vice President looked at her and stated, I don't care what you want. The article goes on to talk about unions. Unions win just 50% of elections when they successfully negotiate an initial contract just half of the time. The National Labor Relations Board is a dog missing teeth. If workers engage in an illegal strike, the board legally must seek a court injunction. If a company illegally fires workers, the board takes months to investigate and cannot levy any fines. It goes on further. I asked Charles R. Schuler, a company spokesperson, about the firings. He said the 22 employees refused to go to work after multiple requests to do so. Quote, the workers, I noted, all said they intended to work that day. He repeated his original statement. He also said that Cablevision negotiated in good faith. He then said, that leads us with the issue of your conflict. You're ready? The reporter said, sure. You, he said, are vice chairman of the Communication Workers of America Union. The person says, who wrote the article, he's got me, sort of. Like most reporters at the New York Times, I'm a member of the Newspaper Guild, which is a part of the Communication Workers of America, which has about 140,000 members in the Northeast. I receive no union pay, and I have no duties. I'm also a Nick season ticket holder and a Cablevision cable customer. I pay far more to Mr. Dolan's companies than I pay to my union in dues. Ms. Johnson feels guilty. She's persuaded her colleagues to, be, to risk being fired. She speaks of walking in the middle of the night and of bills piling up. Her husband is a freelancer. They depend on her health benefits. Quote, it's stressful. The air in our house is very thick, she says. Sometimes I break down, Ms. Johnson said, and asked herself if she's been selfish. Quote, but my husband reminds me, you have a home family and a work family. You must be loyal to both. Now, what's so significant about this case is the anti-worker attitude that Cablevision brought forth to its workers who voted by law to form a union. It was on January 30th, uh, over a year after 282 cable television technicians voted overwhelmingly to be represented by the CWA that they illegally locked out, illegally locked out and fired 
22 technicians uh, who were engaged in protected, legally protected, legal union activity. Uh, after waiting more than 40 minutes, as the article explained, uh, they were told uh, that they were permanently replaced. Since then, five have been called back to work. Permanently replaced usually refers to workers who were on strike, but none of these workers were on strike. In fact, some of them, uh, the workers who were fired, were already in the field on their jobs. Uh, this is a violation of federal labor law, uh, which follows a year of management's delays and refusal to bargain in good faith with the elected union. Uh, they illegally gave raises to every Cablevision technician except those in Brooklyn who voted to form a union in an attempt to blunt the Communication Workers of America's union organizing drive uh, they were having in the Bronx. They left Brooklyn consumers behind with slower internet speeds and they publicly stated that they would disinvest in Brooklyn because of the unionization vote. And they refused in negotiations to agree to even the most basic union contract demands, such as the union security clause and just cause for discharge and discipline. Rather than negotiate a fair contract, Cablevision spent millions on anti-union lawyers to fight the union. And that's more than it would have cost to settle the contract. All Cablevision employees want is to be able to organize and be treated with respect and fairness. And all Cablevision seems to want to do is spend million dollars, millions of dollars to take away those very rights. That's just one problem uh, that we've seen with uh, attempts to bust unions. And the reason we've seen that is because of a provision that also uh, has happened uh, just recently with this Senate uh, in blocking uh, appointments to the National Labor Relations Board, the board that oversees uh, what's going on. So we, we've heard the case of the Brooklyn Cablevision story. But here's why it's especially significant. The reason Cablevision had that confidence in treating its workers so poorly is because it was part of a strategy of illegal firings and the lockout of the workers that stem, stems from larger recent judicial ruling in Washington, D.C. as part of a larger anti-worker strategy. On January 25th this year, Noel, in the Noel Canning ruling, a three-judge panel of Republican appointees to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit Court, or, or Circuit, I'm sorry, overturned a National Labor Relations Board unfair labor practice decision because the court deemed that three NLRB members who helped to decide the matter ascended to their positions due to unlawful recess appointments by President Obama in January of 2012. The ruling went on and destroyed the NLRB's ability to enforce U.S. labor law. As a result, the Cablevision's firings were executed without fear of reprisal. Cablevision is merely the first company to recognize and act on the fact that that ruling can be exploited by anti-worker corporations. The real problem we have is that we can't get the appointments to the NLRB that the President has tried to make because the Senate has refused to place the people. They have taken advantage of the quorum of Senate confirmed members uh, and they made it exceedingly, exceedingly difficult uh, to appoint these because of the 60 vote rule that they have in the Senate. And due to the GOP's unprecedented obstruction and use of the filibuster and secret hold, they essentially have made it impossible for people to be appointed to the NLRB to actually enforce the labor laws, they're the law of the land in this country. Now, it's not just the communication workers that have this story. I have a union in my state of Wisconsin, the operating engineers, that had a very similar story, and this is repeated across the country. These are workers with Local 139, with Propent Specialist, uh, a company in Wisconsin, that have a three-year fight of trying to form a union in violation of the law. Uh, of U.S. law, the company has stopped them from being able to proceed. They started back in October of 2010. Uh, they filed for a petition for election in April of 2011. They had an election in June of 2011 and voted to form the union, uh, at which time people filed objections to some of the votes. Uh, that went on for a period of time until the board decision and directed on April 3rd, 2012. Uh, they certified the election on the 9th of April of last year said that indeed the election after a year was a fair election and they are supposed to within an immediate timeline start negotiations for a contract with the union. It's the law of the land and instead the company 
refuse to. Uh, they keep. Uh, they sent a letter to the union declining the union's request for bargaining late in that month of April. The union then filed uh, a complaint against the employer in May, and the investigation by the labor board uh, had started at that point. The problem is, without the teeth of the NLRB, to this day, three years after starting this process, the workers who voted to form a union still don't have that right to the union that they have by the law of the land in this country because of what's happened at the NLRB. Uh, simply, we have to do something to fix this. We have to make sure that the president can appoint uh, the people that he has to appoint uh, to the NLRB and that those appointments are confirmed so that they can do their valid prescribed by law jobs to ensure that workers have that right to unions when they vote on that. Now, we know if you had the Employee Free Choice Act in place in this country, you wouldn't have to worry about this because it would be very clear that they would be able to negotiate that contract and, and get that done. The problem is, uh, if that were the law of the land, despite support from a bipartisan majority of the House and a strong majority in the Senate, those same 60-vote filibuster rules have held up the ability for us to pass an Employee Free Choice Act in this country. So what's happened? Uh, we have this toothless uh, law, which now is going to allow for more and more abuse uh, that we're going to see. This isn't the only law that we've seen like this, where it's abuse of a law. We have also seen an abuse uh, in the state of Wisconsin, my state. Uh, I was in the state legislature for 14 years before coming this year to be a member of Congress. And two years ago, uh, we had what we refer to in Wisconsin as the uprising. Uh, newly elected Governor Scott Walker at the time uh, had a provision to fix the budget. We were slightly in deficit, not prescribed by law to fix it, but close to that point, and he decided to have a budget fix. But within that budget fix, he went way farther and took an attack on the middle class and the workers of the state of Wisconsin. Uh, he proceeded to, in that budget fix, put a provision that I think the employees have said since they would have agreed to, to pay more for their pensions and health care, although that normally would happen through the bargaining process. But then he went as far as to take away their rights to collectively bargain for public employees and took away their ability to how they pay their dues to their unions. What does paying your dues to a union have to do with the state budget in Wisconsin, a shortfall? Absolutely nothing. But the governor of Walk, uh, Walker abused his job in order to go after the public unions. We have had collective bargaining laws in Wisconsin for over a half a century, and guess what? We've had labor peace for over a half a century in the state of Wisconsin. Only until Governor Walker two years ago decided to take that attack on those public workers and their ability to bargain for the most basic rights. When we're talking collective bargaining rights, you're not just talking their wages, their health benefits, their pensions. You're talking their right to bargain for their workplace safety conditions. Uh, I have visited many prisons in the state of Wisconsin. I used to serve on the Corrections Committee. I want that correctional officer who works and puts their life on the line every day for the safety of my family and everyone else's in the state of Wisconsin. When they see a blind spot and there's not a camera and there's a security risk, they have to have that right to be able to negotiate for those safety concerns. But that was taken away. That's collective bargaining. It's simply someone's right to bargain for the most basic concerns like worker safety. So in Wisconsin, Governor Walker did that. We had the uprising. We call it the uprising because within days of his announcement, we had 10,000, 20,000, 40,000 people come a day to protest the governor's decisions. On the weekend, we had one Saturday 100,000. Another weekend, they estimated it could have been as high as 180,000 people showed up around the state capitol and in the state capitol to protest losing their right as employees to bargain uh, for their laws. Now, what's interesting is we knew when this fight happened that this was going to be a long and hard battle. But even more so, uh, the governor tried to be very strategic. He did this against all public employees, but he excluded police officers and firefighters. Because, let's face it, after 9-11, politically, those are two organizations that are viewed as very re respectfully by the public. So he tried to basically divide and conquer. 
but to the police and firefighters of Wisconsin, to their credit, they stood with every other worker and said an attack on one of us is an attack on each and every one of us. And because they stood with us, uh, it was a stronger, more, co more cohesive effort. You had school teachers and state workers and correctional officers and people who worked for uh, the DNR, Department of Natural Resources, and every state agency standing with police and firefighters and families uh, across the state. But it wasn't having the rallies with 10 and 20 and 40,000 people that mattered, but it was having 800 people in Bayfield, Wisconsin. Now, if you haven't heard of Bayfield, Wisconsin, don't feel bad. Uh, we sometimes say this is a map of Wisconsin. At the very tippy top of the state of Wisconsin, almost in Canada, is a town called Bayfield. But they had 800 people in this small community rally to show their support for workers. So uh, that is what uh, is so important. Um, we saw the other consequences of this law. It was the private unions that also saw this problem because they knew what would happen. Just like the problem happening right now to the communication workers in New York, uh, they knew this would happen in, in Wisconsin. If you first you take away the collective bargaining rights of the public employees, what kind of a signal is that to those companies that have negotiated in good faith with their workers to form private sector unions? Well, sure enough, we know exactly uh, what happened. Within months, uh, we saw unions, private sector unions across the state start to uh, start a fight with their unions. In one particular case, we had a crane company, Manitowoc Crane, where they had one division, uh, one of the unions that negotiates a contract with them in dispute, and they were going to stop production and do unpaid leave for members of other unions. Now, you can't do that. You shouldn't do that. But they went ahead to try to force that on the other workers in order to try to bust that union. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that's the problems that we're seeing right now in this country. Uh, there's another really strong example that we are seeing right now in this very body on a very regular basis. And this is the fight that we are having uh, on behalf of our United States Postal Service. Uh, there has been no question that uh, there has been an attack on the Postal Service. And what happened essentially is uh, a number of years back under the Bush administration, uh, they had this idea to take the Postal Service and the Postal Service alone and no other agency in federal government and make them prepay their retirement systems 75 years into the future. Now, let me give you an example of what that means. That means they're prepaying the pension for someone who's not born today for their retirement a half a century down the road. No other agency, no private company would do that. But we are requiring the Postal Service. So when you hear the Postal Service is losing money, almost every single dollar of those losses is due to the prepayment of this unusual requirement that only the Postal Service has to pay. So what happens, the response? Uh, clearly, I think this is an attempt to try to privatize the system. This is to completely take away a system that I think so many people have relied on for so many years in this country. But this is what we see happening. So recently, uh, we saw there was a move to, say, from six-day delivery to five-day delivery. Well, when you start to do a uh, cutback on that delivery, it has uh, real ramifications on people, uh, on what they're going to receive and how they can receive and the timeliness of that. As a small business owner, again, for 25 years of my life, uh, many small businesses, especially in rural communities, count on the United States Postal Service to help them conduct their businesses so that they can hire the workers who work for them. So here, here's an example. There is a place in Wisconsin called Brooklyn, Wisconsin. Uh, it's just outside Madison, Wisconsin, by about maybe about a half an hour. The people of Brooklyn, Wisconsin, need a post office even more than the people of Brooklyn, New York. Because in Brooklyn, New York, there may be other alternatives. There may be stores that provide similar types of services, not necessarily mail delivery, but other types of delivery that they can go to. But in Brooklyn, Wisconsin, they don't have that luxury. That post office means everything. That small business operating out of Brooklyn, Wisconsin, having that means they can be in business and be able to hire the people in Brooklyn, Wisconsin. And that's Brooklyn. If you go to other rural parts of my district in Lafayette County, uh, in Lafayette County, I guarantee they have a problem with broadband 
So they can't even necessarily do an internet-based business. That post office means everything to them. So when we see some of the attacks that are caused by this absolutely ridiculous requirement to prefund pensions into the future 75 years, that is why they're having financial difficulties. So there is a bill uh, that I am on um, and others called the, the Postal Service Protection Act of 2013. Uh, that act uh, would not only maintain the six-day delivery service we currently have, but it also give the United States Postal Service the ability to reform its funding structure for their employee pensions. It also would direct them to cre use revenue to create innovative postal and non-postal products and services to generate new revenue sources. I mean, let's face it. We know uh, things keep changing and how we are able to communicate and get information out to potential uh, uh, consumers uh, for businesses and to get out to your neighbors and friends. But allow them the ability to do that because if they can, they can make up for those shortfalls. But this absolutely unfair requirement they have uh, puts more than 1,700 United States Postal Service workers in my second congressional district of Wisconsin, it puts their jobs at jeopardy. And for seniors and small businesses, and those who live in rural areas, and those who rely on the Postal Service. Uh, it means a lot to have that post office, that six-day delivery, and to have a service that's strong and affordable uh, like it is in this country. So uh, the, the Postal Service is yet one more of these attacks that we've seen. Bottom line is, thanks to organized labor, uh, they have fought so much for the people of this country for the middle class. One might argue the reason we have a middle class is because of exactly uh, what they've been able to do. Uh, by fighting for the very things that we talked about, things like uh, a smaller work week, giving us that weekend, as I discussed at the beginning of this special uh, time that we've had to talk about labor, has been absolutely crucial. Uh, we have seen uh, the child labor laws that at one time put children as young as five-year-old in this country, uh, their lives and limbs at risk, uh, in large part has been corrected because of the labor movement over the years. The fight for family medical leave, uh, which is so important to families now. If, if you have a child, you adopt a child, you've got a family member who's seriously ill, and you want to spend that final time uh, with that loved one, the uh, reason we have that law in place is because of the efforts of organized labor and others. The fact that we have worker place safety through the OSHA laws, which is so important that you can go to work and not have to expect, because of that work, to have less uh, long of a lifetime. Uh, that's been created because of uh, labor's efforts and so much more. Now, I talked about, uh, I'm a proud member of the Painters and Allied Trades, International Union of Painters and Allied Trades. Uh, I'm a business owner and I'm a union member because I'm proud of the workers that I have, uh, when people are paid a fair wage, you get much more in result for your business. Uh, I know that I have long-term employees because instead of trying to nickel and dime them and not treat them right, by paying a living wage, I get more than that back in return. Uh, and one of the other challenges that unions have faced is this current economy, which is exactly why the Congressional Progressive Caucus introduced the Back to Work budget. Because until we get people back to work, uh, we have all the other economic woes that are surrounded by that. And within the painters and allied trades are part of uh, the building trades within the unions. You know, there's public employee unions, there's private sector unions, but the building trades are the folks who are the bricklayers and the laborers and the operating engineers and the painters and the electrical workers and the carpenters, and I could go on and on, and I apologize to the ones I'm not listing. But though people who work every day in construction, which is one of the markets that's been the hardest hit through this economy, when the economy is good, people who work in the trades are working and they're doing well. But when the economy gets the sniffles, people in construction get a cold. And when the economy gets a cold, people in construction get pneumonia. Uh, it's simply that much of a direct effect to how our economy is doing, which is exactly why uh, we should here in this body not only support uh, the labor laws that we need to and appoint the people to the NLRB so we can enforce the laws we have in place and expand the protections for workers that we need to do in this very body, but we need to get the economy going so that more people are working. 
because the more people who are working, uh, that is going to strengthen and support the economy uh, as we need to. You know, I've listened to uh, people on the other side of the aisle, the Republican side, with their budget presentation this week. And I know that they are very uh, serious about uh, wanting to address uh, the issues that they address uh, from deficit reduction uh, to some of the other issues. The problem is they're going about it in the completely the wrong way. You can reduce the deficit best by getting people back to work. And in the progressive uh, caucus budget, the back to work budget, we do just that. We invest in infrastructure. We invest in putting police and fire back to work. We invest in putting teachers back in the schools. We invest in infrastructure so that those people in the construction industry that are hit with double the unemployment that everyone else is right now can get back to work. And I can tell you from firsthand experience why that investment means something. When Congress several years ago passed the Recovery Act and passed the dollars that came to communities to invest in communities, we saw the benefit in the state of Wisconsin. Uh, I was the co-chair of the Joint Committee on Finance, the committee that writes the state budget for the state of Wisconsin. And we had to approve every single dollar that came through Wisconsin to make sure it went efficiently to build roads, repair schools, and the other services that that funding helped provide. And when we did that, we had a report from the road building industry and the vertical construction industry, not exactly uh, your most progressive or liberal organizations, that said 54,000 jobs were saved or created in the state of Wisconsin because of the recovery dollars and our, our state budget that year. But it was predominantly the recovery dollars. So I was surprised when I sat in this room for my first ever State of the Union speech and heard President Obama talk about the need for more of an investment in infrastructure, just like the budget the Democrats proposed, just like the budget the Progressive, Progressive Caucus proposed. When you talk about that investment, I saw a press release from our speaker of this house who said that no jobs were created in this country from the last recovery dollars. Well, fortunately, the very next week in the Budget Committee, which I serve on, uh, we had Dr. Elmendorf, the head of the Congressional Budget Office, who is our official nonpartisan number crunching agency. And I asked that question. Is this true? Is this true that no jobs were created because of those recovery dollars? And he said uh, that the, according to their statistics, up to 3.3 million jobs were saved or created in this country because of that investment. So it wasn't just the 54,000 jobs in the road building industry back home, much less the other industries. It is the nearly 3.3 uh, million jobs that were helped because of our influx of cash. Because at that time, face it, the economy was down. If people aren't working, they're not spending money. If they're not spending money, businesses can't grow. If businesses can't grow, they can't hire workers. In fact, just the opposite. They were laying off workers. And it has a cumulative spiral effect down. But because of those recovery dollars, we were able to hold off how deep we fell. And since then, under this president, we have had consecutive job uh, creation happening to try to make up for those very deep losses that we had at the end of the Bush administration. But we still need to grow even faster. And that's why uh, we need to continue to work this. When we continue to work hard on creating jobs, uh, we are helping uh, people to be able to help pay taxes and to bring the revenue in so that we can solve our deficit. Uh, that is the single best way to solve the deficit. And again, that same Congressional Budget Office that we all go to on both sides of the aisle to have, uh, get our facts and figures that we work off of, uh, they are the ones who said three quarters of the deficit we'll have in the year 2014 that we just voted on a budget in this House today on is caused by economic weakness, weakness in other words, unemployment and underemployment. You fix that, you solve the deficit. So we don't need to take away the Affordable Care Act and take away all of the benefits that you're going to have from the Affordable Care Act. The fact that adult child at 26 can still be on the parent's policy. That if you have a pre-existing condition, you still have access to health care in this country. You don't need to repeal that in order to solve the deficit. In fact, just the opposite. We have savings in there that will help reduce the rising costs of health care because that's a challenge. I think everyone in this room would agree that we have a challenge with rising, rising health care costs. But we can address that uh, very primarily uh, by keeping uh, that law in place. But the Republicans would have taken that away. And in fact, the Republican budget, it's been estimated, would cost 2 
million jobs next year if it were to become law. We need a very, very different process and a very, very different place for this country to be. Um, as a small business owner, uh, I, I have been an advocate in this house of saying you can be pro-business, you can be pro-labor, I have a union business, and you can be a progressive. And the, none of those are incompatible. Uh, again, to me, uh, one of the smartest things that I was ever able to do as a small business owner is to have a union shop because it allowed me to hire some of the best and most talented people to offer them a fair wage so they can support their families, offer them good benefits so they have health care uh, and, and are in a better place for their families. Uh, and it's a mutual respect that we have that allows it to continue. And it's so important that we have that respect uh, for the people who work in this country, for the middle class, and for those who are aspiring to be in the middle class. Uh, that is the backbone of the country we have to fight on. So when the Republican version of the budget uh, instead is going to take uh, trillions of dollars and put it on the backs of the middle class, uh, it's a reason why the Democrats instead were looking at getting rid of some of the loopholes that are out there, uh, whether it be the subsidies to big oil that we still do, the corporate jet, uh, loophole that they still fund tax breaks for corporate jets. The fact that we give tax breaks to companies that send jobs overseas. None of that uh, makes sense. So the Democrats are working hard to try to take care of that uh, because we know that the backbone again is people getting to work in America and part of the strength of that is the union movement uh, that we have. So I would hope that people would really realize that it is because of the labor movement that we have been uh, able to benefit so very much uh, from what has uh, been able to support the middle class in this country. Uh, there is so much uh, more that unions are facing across the country, uh, whether it be collective bargaining laws, the right to work less for less laws that we just saw happen in Michigan and other places. Uh, it's those sort of laws that sound good on the surface but really hurt uh, the American worker. When you hurt the American worker, uh, that's uh, a serious problem. So uh, with that, Mr. Speaker, uh, again, on behalf of the Congressional, Congressional Progressive Caucus, uh, we are uh, so proud to have spent a little time to talk about uh, the middle class and the American labor movement and what it's done for America. Uh, we salute our uh, brothers and sisters in organized labor, thank them uh, for their efforts, and vow to continue to fight on behalf of the middle class and to make sure that they all uh, have protections and, and standards by following our laws and passing more laws that give workers a voice. And uh, Mr. Speaker, I would like to yield back my time and I thank you for uh, allowing me this time today. The gentleman yields back. Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 3rd, 2013, the Chair recognizes the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. King, for 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, again, it's my privilege to address you here on the floor of the United States House of Representatives, this great deliberative body. And uh, as I've listened to the presentation in the previous uh, segment, it brought a number of things to mind that I expect I'll address because there certainly is a different viewpoint, as we all know. Um, but before I get into the breadth and depth of the topic matter, I'd be very pleased to yield as much time as he may consume to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Perry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I also thank the gentleman, Mr. King from Iowa. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to call attention to legislation addressing security concerns that were drawn out in the aftermath of the September 2012 attack on our consulate in Benghazi, Libya. As you know, terrorist attacks carried out that year took the lives needlessly of four brave Americans. In December, the Account Accountability Review Board released its findings and recommendations. This board found that prior to the Benghazi attacks, some senior State Department officials demonstrated, as they coined it, a serious lack of management and leadership ability. That contributed to the inadequate security posture at the consulate. Now, while this board can recommend disciplinary action against State Department employees who are found to, be, to breach a duty, they also concluded that poor performance in the course of one's employment does not amount to such a breach of duty, which I find fascinating and completely unacceptable. As completely unacceptable as that is, it also requires legislation to change that. And so while I disagree 
that it should require legislation, it does. And with that in mind, I have drafted a bill with the help of the Honorable General Lady from New York, Ms. Meng, that adjusts these criteria. With this legislation, if the board finds that a State Department employee's unsatisfactory performance or misconduct has significantly contributed to a security incident, the board can recommend that the employee be disciplined appropriately. I would ask at this time that all our colleagues join us in supporting this bipartisan legislation, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And reclaiming my time, I thank the gentleman from Pennsylvania for his presentation here. And as I listen to his presentation, I, it comes to mind, uh, the Benghazi incident comes to mind. And whether this is relevant or not is a, is a question that I'm not necessarily prepared to answer, Mr. Speaker. But I do want to make a statement on, on Benghazi. And I would remind people that we lost an ambassador. We lost other brave Americans. We had multiple injuries and casualties there that perhaps uh, well, they run in numbers that might be counted in the dozens. And each of those survivors of Benghazi, the public doesn't yet know a single name of any of the survivors, any of those on, let me say, our side of this argument of the incident in Benghazi, doesn't know a single name of the survivors. We don't know the depth of the injuries that took place, and some of them were severely injured. They've been kept under wraps. They've been told uh, reportedly by the news, Mr. Speaker, that they should not speak and talk about what happened in Benghazi. Now, I remember when uh, Osama bin Laden met his, met his justifiable end. This administration couldn't wait to come out before the cameras and tell us how that all unfolded and couldn't wait to tell us about every detail that wasn't classified on the, on the end of Osama bin Laden's reign as the head of al-Qaeda. They even showed us a picture of the Situation Room on who was in it. We saw the expressions on the faces of the people in the Situation Room, including the President, including the Secretary of State, including the Secretary of Defense, and we knew when they came into the room, the Situation Room, when they heard the reports, how the decisions were made in that White House, and we knew when people left the Situation Room, perhaps to go to something else, um, I don't remember any of them just simply going to bed. But what we don't know is this, and this is what this Congress needs to put together. We need to have a select committee, a joint committee, excuse me, Mr. Speaker, we need a committee that is a, is a committee that's comprised of the best individuals that we can find from the relevant committees here in this Congress or any other individuals in this Congress that have special expertise that would raise their knowledge base and their credibility to the point where we can get the maximum report coming out of this Congress. The circumstances that we have today on looking into the Benghazi incident and the events that flowed from that are several committees that have part of the jurisdiction. The Select Committee on Intelligence has part of the jurisdiction. And they've held some hearings and they have some knowledge. We don't know what that is. Much of it is classified. Much of it just isn't disseminated because that's not the nature of the Select Committee on Intelligence to disseminate information at, uh, to the public. Another, another area that might be our, uh, our, um, our Judiciary Committee under the jurisdiction of what was lawful and what wasn't lawful on what took place there and what might we have been able to do. Foreign Relations Committee has some jurisdiction. Armed Services has some jurisdiction. That's four committees that I can name off the top of my head, Mr. Speaker, and each of them have taken some kind of look into this. But here's what happens. If you take a situation like Benghazi or any major incident and you break it down into four components and you assign or the jurisdiction of each committee chair would look at this and claim jurisdiction, which they rightfully can do in this Congress, they would take their component of it, study it, they might write out a report, and it might be complete, and it might be completely accurate. They can send that out, the unclassified portion, to the American people. That report goes out. Then, that, say that's Select Committee on Intel. Then, Mr. Speaker, the, um, the Foreign Affairs Committee can meet, and they can call the witnesses that they choose to do so and gather that information and perhaps a, write a completely objective and completely truthful report and send it out to the public, all of that that's not classified. The same thing can happen with Armed Services Committee, the same thing can happen with the Judiciary Committee or any other committees that might have some jurisdiction, but invariably what you have are silos of information. A silo of information coming out of the Select Committee on Intel, part of it classified that would stay in there. 
a silo of information coming out of Armed Services, out of Judiciary, out of, out of Foreign Affairs Committee. And these silos of information, just like silos, don't match up. You can't, you can't square the circle with the information that comes because there are gaps in their jurisdiction and because they have gaps in the expertise that doesn't match together like a hand in glove or a finely machined gear. It is, so what you, what you end up with is, and even if they did match perfectly, you would still have four reports from four different committees presented to the public. Each one would have to be deciphered by who? Scholars? The press? What might it be? And so if we are going to get to the bottom of Benghazi, we've got to put together a selected committee that represents all of the jurisdictions in the United States Congress and all of the oversight in the United States Congress. And if we do that, then we have the kind of committee, a commission, that is, that is similar in nature to that of the 9-11 Commission or the Warren Commission, which produced, in the end, a one composite report, a book, Mr. Speaker, that the American people can look at, that they can count on it being factual, they can count on it being objective, they can count on, they can count on it, and they can critique it if they have information out there that challenges it. The Warren Report was challenged, but it stands still as an accurate representation of the facts of the assassination of John F. Kennedy. The 9-11 Commission stands alone. That report stands alone as the broadest and most objective and complete report that Congress could put together, and we have acted and reacted on recommendations from the 9-11 Commission. We need to do the same thing with Benghazi. If we do not, if we do not, Mr. Speaker, history will forever question whether there was a cover-up on what happened in Benghazi. In fact, we already know there has been. We know that um, the administration went out and sent Susan Rice out to, to do the talk shows, all of her five different talk shows on, on Sunday, just several days later, to tell us that all of this, this uh, violence that erupted in the streets of Benghazi came about because of a, of a movie, a video that was produced. Now, as far as I know, the individual that exercised his freedom of his First Amendment rights to produce that video may still be in jail. That's the only punishment that's come out that I know of from Benghazi. I think he should be released. But that's the first story. And then we've got different stories that were brought out of the administration, pried out because usually the press, but sometimes an American citizen found that information, got it out on the Internet, the press found it, and we've been picking up pieces of the Benghazi for six months. And we still don't have the truth. And the people who survived Benghazi need to come before this Congress under oath and tell us their story. Now, if there are components of this that are classified, if our national security is at risk, then members of this Congress should be called into a classified setting and told. These are the reasons why we're covering this up. If, they, if this administration came open with members of Congress, we would honor the reasons for classified standing. But they have not. They tried to cover it up in the first place. They tried to convince us it was a video. And, and since that time, then, the argument was made that there was no military relief that could have come into Benghazi because it was logistically not possible. That, I would say, is questionable at best. Piece after piece needs to come out into the public, Mr. Speaker. And I'm a, I'm a strong advocate for Frank Wolf's proposal that we set up that committee to examine all of this and produce a report for the American people. And so... That's simply triggered by my questions when I listened to the gentleman from Pennsylvania, and I would expect that you would ask to yield if any of that was inaccurate. And in the seeing that, um, does the gentleman from North Carolina come to the floor for any reason? And I'd be happy to yield if that's the case. I'd be grateful if the gentleman would yield one minute, Mr. Speaker. It would be my honored privilege to do so. I'd be happy to yield uh, to, the, to the gentlelady from North Carolina. I thank my colleague.